All right, everyone. Well, this is Sandcast Beach Volleyball with Tri Bourne and Travis Moore. Or Tri, me and Tri, uh, we haven't been together in quite a long time oh. and won't be. I know. And, and it is sad. I miss my guy. Yeah. And uh, we won't be together for a little bit longer because I am uh, in Bulgaria uh, doing something that I never would have thought uh, I'd have been doing. Uh, I'm shooting a, uh, a movie. And I'm sitting across the table here from the CEO of New Boyana Film Studios, Yurif Lerner. Hey, nice, nice to see meet you again. Yeah. Happy to have you back here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you were here for a couple of tournaments here, so you know the place well enough. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, it was cool to, uh, we did a little test shoot a while back and uh, just to see how it would look on camera and stuff. And, and uh, just seeing you out there, you're just kind of a natural on camera, so I thought, you know, why not give you the role of Kenny? And that's how it started. <laughs> it's so crazy. So the first time that me and Adam came out to Bulgaria was, I think the first time it was like mid-May, or maybe yeah. a little, like early-ish May. Yeah, um, that's right. And you're, you are a legend, by the way, back <laughs> in, in the South Bay. Uh, from how long you were there, because uh, I met you before we went out. Cause yeah, you, you I was came... there in Hermosa, actually. Yeah. 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 What were you doing in Hermosa again? Uh, I was just there for business, and you know, whenever I go to California, obviously there's a side of my life that's a movie, but then there's a history of my life, which was beach volleyball. So I always just love going down to the beach and just chilling there, watching, playing, yeah. remembering the days that I used to be out there, and just yeah. seeing how things have changed and how things have uh, stayed the same. Yeah. So yeah. And. So you, I, I kind of want to talk about like your sort of history in, in beach volleyball. So your life experience is like, you've been so many places. You, I have you were been, born yeah. in Tel Aviv, yeah. uh, raised predominantly in, in South Africa. Correct, yeah. I moved um, to South Africa at a young age. With, with a brief stop in Paris, right? London, London. London for five years. London for five years. Yeah. And then how did you make your way over to the States? And I, I kind of want you yeah. to just like... So, how you just dominated the beach volleyball scene. <laughs> I wish I'd dominated, dominated many other things, but uh, actually in South Africa, every summer I would go to the beach to play. I lived there with my grandfather who lived in Cape Town. I lived in Joburg, but for three months of the year, from the age of 15 on to 18, I would spend every waking moment on the beach in Camps Bay. And uh, my first sort of experience with, with volleyball uh, other than just playing pickup games, I was a basketball player growing up, much like you, I think. Yeah. You're a basketball player. Yeah. So I could run and jump, and then volleyball just came naturally to me, and it was such a, a way better sport for me. I don't know why. It was just so much more fun for me than basketball. Yeah. Uh, and so at 15, I went to Cape Town, and I just walked onto the court and just played a pickup game. And that summer, the FIVB came into town for, in South Africa. Okay. And I saw a very high level, and I thought, wow, that's amazing. And so I would just play, and, and in South Africa, I was, I was sort of a big fish in a small pond. Yeah. By the time I was 18, I was playing with a good friend of mine, uh, Jason Kruger, who went on to play in Canada, but uh, we were pretty good there, and yeah. uh, you know we, we had a lot of fun games. And um, so I thought, this is something that I would love to do, but then I go to London, and it's cold and foggy and damp, and... I ended up playing a lot of indoors, which I had sort of picked up earlier. But th that, I think it was 19, what was it, 86 was the first time of the Olympic Games? Or 96. 96, Atlanta. yeah, 96, yeah. I'm not that old. But uh, <laughs> uh, Karch wanted that. Yeah. Uh, and in an interview, uh, he says, well, I had the best job in the world. My office is at the beach. And that kind of clicked. And I said, okay, I got to go to California. Yeah. So there, I pack everything up in London. Uh, I was two weeks away from getting a British passport, but my dad had moved to California earlier. Okay. He was in the film business. I actually grew up in the film business. So I said, I'd like to come and work, work there in California. And the first job I got to actually was a chef because that was a, what I was doing in London. Yeah. But, uh, um, but that was a lot of hours on the feet. Yeah. And so I ended up working for my dad back in the film industry for a bit, reading scripts. Okay. Telling him if they're good, they're not good, whether they're supposed to be commercial or whatever. Yeah. And so I could do that during the day and, and go and play a lot of beach. So that's kind of my introduction to beach volleyball. And it was a wake-up call because coming from South Africa, being pretty good on the local tour to then training uh, with, you know, some of the top players in the world, it was a huge jump. Yeah. And I remember uh, going to the Santa Monica Pier where they had a workup system. And you start in court four, and 
if you win, you go to three, two, one, and the goal is to stay in one. Otherwise, you get knocked, knocked out. Yeah. And and no one would want to play with me because I was shitty. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you can leave that out. And and I just would go train in the mornings from seven to nine, where I met uh, a guy by the name of Tom Black who kind of helped me out. He was a AAA player at the time, and I was a, a nobody. But you know, we got to be friends, and he helped yeah. me out. So we trained in the morning with a coach called Mark Barber. And at 9 o'clock, the, the bigger guys would come, like Sinjin and Randy. Yeah. They'd come and play, and they'd beat up on us for their warm-up. Yeah. And then we would kind of get kicked off the court and go down and play the pier. So from 7 a.m. in the morning to 9 a.m., I'd be at Serrano Beach training there. From 9 to 4, I'd be at the Santa Monica <laughs> Pier. I'd take a brief break till about 6, and then the evening crowd would come. So I'd yeah. just play all day. <laughs> that's amazing. And, and that's where I actually met Min, who was also playing at the Santa Monica Pier. Okay. I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, it was it was a good time in that time. Actually, yeah. we we were playing against a young Misty May who was at probably I don't know twelve years old playing with her dad. <laughs> and there were a lot of legends that came through the San Marco Pier, and you know Randy would come out there and beat up on us. Yeah, uh, Andrew Smith, Sinjin's younger brother, the Barbers. There were a lot of players from that time. Yeah, uh, and at that time, um, I was determined to stay in California. I wanted to live as close as possible to the beach. And uh, I bought a house there with Tom, Eric, and Dan. Uh, I said, hey, let's all buy a house. He said, no, it's crazy. The yeah. market's high. Uh, I said, I'll buy a house and I'll just rent out rooms to cover the mortgage and, and I'll take the risk. Yeah. So I did that. There was a District 11 loan for first-time buyers, uh, which allowed you to get a house without any credit history. So I applied for that. It was super low interest for the first two years and then... It, it sort of jacked up, but that was a, yeah. a trick in when, it. When did you buy the house? Oh, gosh, 1997, 98, I think. Okay, yeah. got it. And so we had four volleyball players living there. Yeah. And Eric Mai, Dan Thompson, Tom Black all played together at UCSD, and I had played, uh, you know, in, in South Africa. So every day we would go and play a house game as well, which was yeah. super fun, and that was down in Venice. So... Uh, they, they ended up moving out and moving into different things, but over the years, I had rented out to different volleyball players. I had kept the rent the same for, I think, 12 years, maybe 13 years. <laughs> That's At $400 <laughs> a month per room. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so many great players came through the house. But the, the goal was not to make money on the house, just to cover the mortgage, which I had fixed. And that's all I needed. Right. So for, you know, $1,200... I had covered the, the mortgage every month and yeah. no one had to work super hard. They could all train, yeah. which was great because at the time there was this big property boom that was happening, which went up until 2008 and rent in the area was going up to thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars Yeah, and guys were able to rent in the house. And also I had illegally converted the garage into a place to live <laughs> where, where, Aaron Smith, Dave Smith, Kevin Wong, Scott Wong, and many other players had also taken residence yeah. there. <laughs> uh, I think I can count, I, I want to say, out of the last six Olympics, at least 80% of the people had lived in the house at one point in their career. That is amazing. Yeah. I mean, Nick was there for a while. Phil was uh, staying down in South Bay where he would come over a lot. Yeah. We'd have epic Halo battles. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm rambling all over the place, so I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're that. good. But, I mean, Billy Allen lived there yes, for Billy quite Allen, a bit. Yes, Billy Allen, yes. John Mayer. John Mayer. Uh, Actually, his, his wife, Paula, had moved in and John was really? coming over. Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah, so that's how John ended up there. But, yeah, he was over there a lot. Um, Adam lived there for a bit, right? Adam lived there, yeah. yeah. Uh, amazing. Adam had a similar situation in Carolina where... He'd have a volley house there where Phil and Nick would live. And then yeah. in the summers, he'd come to they'd just come on California. Over. So he'd come over, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was a super fun experience because everyone there was competitive. Yeah. So it just extended beyond the volleyball. There was an insane amount of trash talk. There was uh, there's a video games. We're playing Halo in two different rooms. And, and it was the battles were <laughs> epic. There were players, I don't know, you probably wouldn't have heard of Dan Thompson, but he was a really good good player, you know, AAA qualifier level, Yeah. but an amazing Halo player, and <laughs> More such a good shit talker, <laughs> and uh, he would 
get under people's skin in, in ways you couldn't even believe. Yeah. And so you had that house. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then you ended up making your way back into the film industry, obviously. Yeah. Um, so when did you start kind of, when did film start to take the higher priority over volley? Uh, it was kind of a, a, a thing of necessity rather than want because right. uh, my uncle was running the studio in Bulgaria and I had been working with him on various projects uh, here and there, but he got diagnosed with cancer, okay. uh, melanoma in, in his mouth, which is oh. super complicated and Real. untreatable. And um, so when he went back to, I went to work with him and we went back to treatment, I would stay at the studio and just run things okay. because we needed someone that we could trust, the family, because there's yeah. a... My uh, my father, his brother Danny, Trevor Short and Danny Dimbert, they're four partners running the company. Okay. So uh, when in 2013 we had the Expendables three, which was my first big project. Uh, I was handling the behind the scenes footage, but also uh, working a lot with with him behind the desk because okay. he would face the actors, but then he was super tired because of treatment. Right. And I would have to take a lot of his workload. Okay. Over. So it was kind of trial by fire. When he went back for treatment, uh, mid, early 2014, I just stayed. Yeah. And he didn't make it through the treatment. I think the treatment was more harmful than the, you know, the, than the, the disease. So, yeah. So I just stayed and I never left. And that's how I just ended up running a, a studio. I had previously run an online yoga company called Adaya. Okay. I had four people with me and overnight I had 400 people under me. So it was a big... Quite the transition. Yeah, big transition. And the, the interesting thing is learning how not to do stuff and to delegate because right. once you're doing one thing, a lot of other things don't happen. Yeah. So you got to kind of... I read this great book called The One Minute Manager and, and I've applied these principles. If it takes you longer than a minute... Do it yourself. Yeah. If you can do it in under a minute, delegate it. Yeah. So those are the things, Ooh, you know. I like that. Yeah. 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 Well, I know that when I first went to Bulgaria this summer, um, the amount of text messages I got from people, I was like, Bulgaria, like, I, I'm not going to know anyone in Bulgaria. Yeah. It's, it's Bulgaria. Like, you know, yeah. what is in there? And then Billy, Mayor, Kevin Wong, yeah. everyone texted me and they're like, you got to see your reef. <laughs> and then I ended up meeting you right yeah. before I went. You came out, um, you watched me and JM practice against Chase Budinger and Avery. Yes. Uh, and That's then right. I saw you like maybe two days later yeah. um, with, uh, when we were running that little King of the Beach. Yeah. Um, and then you came out uh, and then I ran into you here and it is amazing. Like wh what you have, like I'd never seen a movie studio before. Yeah. And we went to, like I, I just thought it would just be like a building. Yeah, it's a whole city. It's a that, whole city. That you just like build and make new again for whatever you want to make. It's incredible. You know, it's funny. Everyone says, "What's it like living in Bulgaria?" And I always say, "Well, I don't know. I live in Bulgaria. <laughs> yeah. There's it's a world on its own because <laughs> yeah, as you say, it's a whole city. You can go from London to New York in under a minute. Yeah, just by walking. <laughs> you know." Foot traffic and and the people you meet are from all over the world: yeah. Germans, French, English, you know, Americans, and it's such an international uh, community. In fact, like right now, I have about twenty Moldovian people coming yeah. from an area called Bessarabia that are working in the studio. Yeah, super interesting. They're they're Bessarabian, which means they used to live in this region, or their families used to live here. And when the Ottoman invaded, they kind of escaped up to Moldova, but they have a connection here so a lot of their yeah. family so they can actually come here they have parents that are bulgarian and stuff. okay uh and the, i don't know if you've ever been to moldova but it's one of the poorest countries in the world and 38 percent of their income is from workers that leave moldova come to work in Bring other countries back. and send money back that's like uh that's so sad yeah it's sad but it's also like they're amazing people because they're just you know down to earth they yeah. they get it they like to work they appreciate it and yeah. they're they're the happier, right? Far happier than many of the people that are earning a lot of money <laughs> yeah. that I meet, and I do meet a lot of people that are billionaires. Yeah, and and to compare the sort of like uh, sort of outlook on life from someone, and they're intelligent too. They're like study, and you know, some of them are lawyers. <laughs> yeah, and they're working as carpenters. But the sort of outlook of someone who's just grateful to have a job, and and feels rich. But they're earning a lot less than someone who makes a lot of money but feels poor because right. they're always wanting more. Yeah. It's kind of like in, in Buddhism, they call it the hungry ghost, you know. Yeah. It's a, a counter with a 
really thin neck and a big stomach. You're yeah. never satisfied. Yeah. So, so yeah. That's an interesting, that's a good image. Yeah. Yeah. But it like, I mean, just on this movie set alone, um, which I've never been on a movie set yeah. either, which it's wild just how many people are involved. Yeah. And this is like, I mean, a legit crew, but I've no like the Expendables has to be like 20 times the size. Expendables is about like 30 times the size of this. Uh, which is crazy. We have about 60 people. They have about 500 just overall. And then, you know, if you look at a movie, it's one of the most collaborative uh, jobs on earth. Yeah. Uh, if you're a real estate agent, you buy a house, you sell a house, it's one-on-one. -on -one, right. And you make money off the commission and all that stuff. In a, in the movie set, which is actually something that's being addressed right now as we speak with the potential strikes with IATSE, there's like 500 to 2,000 people working on one product. Right. And all of them are super important. There's not one person that's, you know, you think the actor is the one. Obviously, you're going to see a movie because the actor, but right. if he doesn't have a good director who tells him how to act or a good DP who lights him well, a good sound recorder that, that gets the the words out, right? you know, a good composer that adds all the emotion underneath, a, a sound designer that just creates something that you've never heard before, but right. gives you a feeling. Yeah. The, the actor's nothing. So going through the process of, of making a movie and watching the assembly from the assembly, when you watch it, you're like, oh my God, this is awful. Yeah, right. To the point where you've done your final mix and like, we're going to get an Oscar. Yeah. To the point where you don't get the Oscar. <laughs> but going through that whole process, uh, you go through so much to make a movie. Yeah. And and you go through stages where you love it, you hate it, you're frustrated, you're over the moon and all these things. That, and you yeah. come together with people for a period of time and and they're your your soldiers, your your generals, you know. Yeah. We're all going to to war. And then it's gone. And then you're like, huh, you have yeah. that feeling. So it's 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 a unique experience. Yeah, can you like watch a movie, any movie, just and be entertained by it, or are you always thinking like, man, like what a good shot, like what a good mix, how the, they my, do this? My favorite movies are the ones I watch and I just get into the story. You just get lost. Yeah. If I say, oh, that's good CGI, and I I see that also with an audience. If you notice something in the movie, you're already thinking about the movie. Right. You. The, the job of a movie maker and it's, you know, is to take a person, they come into the theater, they have all their problems at their door, and they leave the theater and all their problems are waiting right. when they leave the door. But for those two hours, all their problems are gone and yeah. they're in a story. So if you can do that, if you can take someone's attention, and it's getting tougher and tougher because, you know, things are pulling at our attention constantly. So yeah. if you can take someone's attention... And a good movie is the one where you can sit in the back of the room and you won't notice a cell phone light. Yeah. Go on. That's when you know you've done a good movie. So that's kind of like we do, we often test our movies. And one of the things that filmmakers do when they test the movies, they, they sit at the very back and they watch the audience watching. The oh, film. interesting. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. Often, actually, we actually film the audience. We tell them ahead of time. Yeah. Uh, and we create a laugh track or uh, an emotional track behind it. Yeah. So that the director can see what the audience feels. You know, you can have a thought, it comes in and out your head in two seconds. Right. You can have an emotion and it stays with you for two or three days. And the goal of a movie is to add an emotion okay. to a thought. You know, that's when you've done a good movie. Because, you know, you have those emotional thoughts that go in your head and they're, they're there. And they're there again. And, they're there, and you're like, why am I thinking that? Yeah. Why? stop it you know <laughs> right. that's the chemical adding to the electrical you know okay. and pulling you deeper into this from the head to the heart yeah your emotions are taking over so if you've managed to you know they say grab you by the throat yeah with a movie then you've made a good movie you've done job. yeah what uh what do you think is the best movie you've done in terms of that attaching the chemical to the electrical oh gosh uh let me think uh Best movie I've done. You know, I, I, I hate saying I've done a movie. But maybe I'm the a, most, the one I'm that you're most of, proud yeah. of, like having worked with. There's so many, it's such a tough question because yeah. there's so many different aspects of movies that I'm proud of uh, versus, you know, like uh, I remember the first uh, Hitman's Bodyguard, which I was really involved with. Yeah. Just uh, 
starting to laugh with the movie. Yeah. And, and that was a really good feeling because I was there on the set. I was there with the director in post. I was yeah. working with him on music. I was working on all the parts and never saw the whole. And then we did the test screening and I saw, saw the whole and I was like, okay, we've got something, yeah. something special here. Yeah. You know? Everyone kind of brought it yeah. so, on so many departments. Uh, the other one, which I'm particularly proud of, uh, was the movie Angel Has Fallen. Okay. Where it was just a, a battle to get made. Yeah. And uh, we had we have our own VFX company, Worldwide FX, and there was another company in Canada, Digital District, that had partnered with, okay. with the movie. And in the middle of the show, we started getting slower and slower shots for VFX. And I kept calling up the rep for Digital District. I said, hey, is everything going well? Blah, blah, blah. And at the time, we were doing Hellboy, and we gave him another sequence for Hellboy. And uh, that sequence didn't come in on time either. So I called up the supervisor for Hellboy, and I said, what's going on with the sequence? He says, oh, you don't want to know what's going on here. So I realized something was up <laughs> with the company. Yeah. Uh, the owner in Paris had had a falling out with the manager in Canada. Okay. They had a fight. They went into a lawsuit. We had partnered up with them for the show 50-50. And they had a very big sequence, the drone sequence. Yeah. Uh, and we learned that they're going bankrupt. And now the trustee uh, took the server. So we're talking to them, yes, you have the server. It's a physical thing. But on the server sits our assets, which is a digital thing. And right. we need those back to complete the movie. Yeah. And they were like, well, you have to go to the courts to do that. <laughs> so I said, well, is there a way we can copy and, and just, because we paid for this work. Right. Right. And now we're three months away from releasing the movie. <laughs> and we had to recreate the entire sequence, uh, which took them a year and a half in order to <coughs> re-deliver the movie in three months from, from QuickTime, which are low-res versions of the shots. So yeah. everything that was created there was recreated by, by our team. And we worked overtime and, and you know, it was 11 p.m., the day before we were supposed to deliver the movie to the distributor, 12 a.m., and I get a call from the director. Hey, we left a Chiron off, which is just a small little thing about news at 11, a little text yeah. on the scene. And we can't, we can't deliver it. So I'm calling up the distributor and said, listen, there's one shot. We delivered everything. There's one shot that's not perfect. Can right. I re-deliver it? Yeah. I said, no, we have to send it out to theaters. And... Uh, <laughs> What happened is, is I created a, a pass. I woke up the Dundee, who's our head of VFX. Yeah. I said, Dundee, we got a big problem. Uh, I woke up Jifko, head of post production. Jifko, we got a big We need to create a patch. And we sent that patch to every single theater across the globe <laughs> to make sure that the Chiron, just a little thing that said News at 11, oh exists my in the final thing. Gosh. Because the distributor has to give it to the theaters, the theaters right. load it onto their servers, and it plays it to the audience. And, and that movie did great and was one of the toughest movies ever because of what happened with, right. with a company going bankrupt in the middle of a show. Luckily, we would have been screwed, but luckily uh, we have our own company and those guys, I mean, deserve so much credit of yeah. what they did in such a <clears throat> short amount of time. You know, I can't even thank them enough. Yeah. You know. That's incredible. I mean, and, and you're like... <clears throat> It's sort of the, the head of all this where I know that basically you have to become a master delegator. Yeah. But that's a lot of stress. I was incredible you. stress. I mean, you have had to have gotten so good at just like seeing problem, solving problem. Yeah. It's, <laughs> you know, the, the thing uh, actually, the best thing that I learned in my life was, was when I was training in beach volleyball. I also took a lot of yoga sort of as a supplemental thing. Yeah. Uh, there's a great teacher I worked with called... Travis Elliott, who I partnered up and did some uh, the ultimate yogi with, but he would put us in poses which were uncomfortable and keep us there. Yeah. So you're like Warrior Three. I don't know if you do yoga, but yeah, yeah. It's one leg behind you. Warrior Three is brutal. Yeah, it's brutal, and he keeps you there, and then he talks to you, and you're like, F you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. You're sitting there in a the pose, and you're, yeah. your sweat's dripping, and and he says, okay. Uh, you know, you're in Warrior Three. It's also called airplane mode, and and you're a pilot in in heavy turbulence. But can the pilot stay calm? 
and physically you're feeling it because yeah. you're balancing. Right. Mentally you're feeling it because you're stress and, and you just your body's screaming at you to get out of this pose right. and then emotionally you're feeling it because he's just irritating you right. by by saying little things that right. he knows are yeah. not not the right things to be said at that time and he, yeah you know i've been to his class many times i know how he does it but you know he makes a joke at the wrong approach right you know he plays the wrong music at the wrong time yeah but, but he, he's always challenging you in ways and then he says you know problems are not problems they're just opportunities for growth Oh, I like that. You know, so that mentality is like, okay, so someone's freaking out. This is going wrong. I'm freaking out as well. There's something wrong, but this is not a problem. This is just an opportunity for growth. Yeah. And at the end of the day, we're not open heart surgeons. We just make movies. You got to have perspective on that. You right. Know? It seems like it's the end of the world at the time. Yeah. Really isn't. But there are some challenges and there are a lot of stakes. Uh, Angel has fallen, for example, Lionsgate had probably spent about $30 million in publicity and advertising. Yeah. Right? So all the ad campaigns are for an opening date. Yeah. Uh, the poor post-production supervisor, Tracy Lehman, is dependent on us to deliver something on time because she has a ton of work to do after that. Yeah. You know, in different versions and formats, this IMAX, this 4DX, there's all these different streamer versions. Right. And she has to create deliverables for all of them. And I'm not giving her what she needs so she can do what she, she has to do. Right. So she's saying, no, I don't care about this, Kyron. And on one side, my director is saying, Rick, he said, that's the most important part of the movie. If it doesn't say News at 11, who would know it's News at 11? <laughs> you know, right. Then my whole story takes place over a period of time. And News at 11 should come on at this particular point with right. this cue of music and, and this color blue, which is not blue green but it's light blue right because it's calming and, and every frame is thought about yeah you know you see a movie uh you see a scene that takes about two seconds but that might have taken two weeks to to give you that two seconds right. you know so everything is thought about so the director is yelling at me on one side she's yelling at me at the other side i'm in the middle i'm trying to work out how we're going to possibly do this because yeah. it's literally impossible and uh you know something i also learned like a good Athlete makes the impossible possible, yeah. the possible easy, and the easy look elegant. That's Ooh, something I, love I, that. I learned to long. So what's impossible, you know? Yeah. Well, it's just there are barriers, obviously. There, there are obstacles. Uh, you can be a, you know, right through it. You can drive through it, or you could be a river and go around it. Yeah. Or you could stay and sit with it. And There's so many different ways to look at something, right. an obstacle. And so you just got to stay, breathe, think, okay, What's holding it up from being done? Right. Okay. The whole movie obviously takes six hours to upload and six hours to download. It's a big file. Yeah. That can't happen. Right. Right. Uh, the the theaters need it at twelve a.m. so right. they can do their work. Okay. Can't contact the theaters with six and six hours. Right. What if we just did a patch to replace it? So you work with the projectionist now. Yeah. You say, hey, I'm just sending you this file. It's three megabytes. Just lay it onto exactly there. Yeah. And you give them instructions and then you follow up. Did they do it the right, the right way? Right. You know, and it, if you do it the right way and you figure out what the obstacle is, you address that, everything that seems impossible becomes possible. Yeah. You know, Obviously, I'm not uh, saying you should fly out the window because right. that is impossible. But, but <laughs> right. many things that seem impossible are actually possible if you just approach it from a different different way of right. thing. So in every movie, you have these things that happen. Yeah. You know, yesterday we had the Czech flags <laughs> that were upside down. <laughs> that means that Czechoslovakia is going to war. Right. On one sense, you can say it was intentional. Hey, this is a war. We're qualifying. Right. <laughs> Uh, on another sense, Dude. you can say, okay, there's ways to fix this. Right. So funny. I, yeah. So I put up a video of uh, just like the set, just walking out and, yeah. and like, this is what we're doing. We're shooting a movie. This yeah. is positively yeah. insane. And uh, and I had, I'm friends with a couple of Czech players. Yeah. And they're like, Dude, <laughs> Czech flag. Yeah. And it was funny because like it had gotten caught earlier in the day. Yeah. Um, but it, it was really funny because like I, I would have never noticed but then no. the Czech players were like don't go to war <laughs> don't go to war yeah. <laughs> exactly I was cracking USA up. versus Czechoslovakia <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> that is hilarious. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we have a, a friend of the director, Henry, a super cool guy, and kind of a. He was brought on. Uh, a man brought him on, and he said, uh, "I'll have him do DIT." I said, "No, man, that's, that's a bit much. DIT is the whole movie. If he messes up with a card, do we lose? What about having him work with you on production design?" Yeah. And he did that. He embraced the role and, and comes along as production designer. But there's minor details that he doesn't know and right. no one would know. But a production designer would know who's... But obviously, we don't have you know the top production designer in the world. It's, right. It is a, a low-budget indie movie. movie. It's yeah. not Expendables. Yeah. So these details get missed. And all along the way, we've been missing details like this constantly. Yeah. We're fixing them, but yeah. it's always been like, uh, put your finger in the dam kind of thing. Right. So... You know, it's funny, you know, the budget doesn't dictate how difficult the movie is. Right. It's, it's you know, a big budget movie can go easier than a small budget movie. A small budget movie can can do a lot better than a yeah. big budget movie. Yeah. You know, like Whiplash, for example, one of my favorite movies. If if someone came to pitch to me and said, would you green light Whip, Whiplash? I'll say, what's it about? And it's about a drummer. What does he do? He drums. <laughs> You're like, no one's going to watch that. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> You know, yeah. <laughs> I can't spend even a million dollars. I'd rather spend fifty million dollars on Rambo than one right. million on a drummer. Yeah, you know, you, you just look at what people want to see. Yeah, and for every one Whiplash, there's ninety nine others, almost Whiplash movies that right. never quite that made didn't it. Didn't quite make it. Yeah. So as you mentioned, I mean, you've worked on like some huge movies. I mean, yeah. You had Expendables. Now you're working on Expendables Four. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you got uh, Rambo. Um, yeah, you did like Angel Has Fallen, Hellboy, like a lot of big things. So, so why a movie on beach volleyball? Well, I love the sport. That's yeah. pure and simple. I, and the other thing is, I've never seen it represented in the way that we're trying to represent. Whether, yeah. whether we succeed or fail is up to the audience. But what we're trying to do is take you inside the game in yeah. a way that's never been done before. Because Side Out, for example, if you've seen the most famous beach volleyball movie. Yeah. For a beach volleyball player, that's a crappy movie. It doesn't represent anything. It's not realistic. A guy... A lawyer. A lawyer <laughs> in two weeks cannot uh, compete at the level. And a washed-up player, you know, who allegedly threw the match. I mean, the storyline's okay. It's not great. But for a beach volleyball player, it's like, it's what garbage. the hell? Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're playing against Sinjin and Randy in the finals right. in two weeks. And he's doing a... Completely illegal 360 <laughs> set. So, but what is it in the game that makes us fall in love with it? And what is that feeling when you're getting served at game points? Yeah. And how do you uh, translate that to an audience that doesn't get it? Wh what is it that makes us love the game? We, kn we know why we love the game. Yeah. The adrenaline, the feeling, the constant competition, the, the self-improvement, the drive the getting up in the morning when no one's up and, and practicing because in, in three months you have a tournament. Right. You know, those those little things. Uh, yeah. The nuance. And uh, I should tell you a joke about nuance, but it's not for podcasts. <laughs> uh, I just learned it. But anyway, the nuance of the game um, is, is incredible, you know. And how do we take the camera inside the game? And they did it on other sports movies. They did it on Friday Night Lights and, yeah. and any given Sunday, but never done it with beach volleyball. Whenever we've represented beach volleyball, it's always been a very superficial representation. Yeah. It's in Top Gun where Tom Cruise, you know, he's not the tallest guy. <laughs> right. But, but he spikes down straight against Maverick. And, yeah. you, know, you know, so I've always felt like it's been an un unrepresented sport in yeah. the world. And it's such an amazing sport, particularly beach volleyball. Because indoor volleyball, you show up the match at 8, 9.30, you're done. You've seen two gr great teams play, but it's beach volleyball is different. It is. You're on the beach the whole day. Mm -hmm. You're interacting with the crowd. You're traveling the world. You're making friends. You're connecting with people in such a unique way. Yeah. Uh, year after year, you return to cities and you're like, hey, Sally, how you been? And, right. and you end up, Sally says, hey, come over for dinner with the family when you're done. Right. There's there's that aspect. And then there's the the players. I know we talked a bit about Eric yeah. in, the, in our last thing, but players that move across the globe, give up everything, which I've done myself, right. just to pursue a dream that's not financial. You, you know you're never going to make money on the right. sport just because you love it. Yeah. And that's so pure to me. Uh, the fact that you could do something for love 
uh, just for love. Right. You know, when you work out the finances, even Phil and Nick, you know, obviously they, they make a lot of money, but they have a year to live. They got trainers and coaches yeah. and wives and families. Yeah. When you look at the finances of that, they could be doing other things to make more money. Right. You know, uh, Ryan Doherty is a great example. He was a great baseball player and could have progressed also there, but he just fell in love with beach volleyball and switched. Yeah. Why would he take something where he can earn more money at, at a lower level AAA baseball than beach volleyball where he could play at the top level? And did he, did he win with Mayor once or they came close? Yeah, or with yeah him and Mayor won a couple. Yeah, yeah I mean, what, what a journey. Yeah. Uh, a baseball player, you know, gonna head in that direction, loves the game, switches, ends up winning, you know. Yeah. Obviously, he had some amazing gifts. Yeah. You know. Uh, I got a good friend here, Jack Quinn, who uh, <laughs> was hilarious, but he always used to say, God prefers tall players that jump high in beach water. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's you, really funny. <laughs> you know, the players like, oh, uh, you know, football players are classic. Like, oh, th I want to thank the Lord, thank Jesus. You right. know, yeah, he yeah. helped me win this game. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> But in beach volleyball, he loves the tall players that jump high. <laughs> he loves the Phil Dahlhauser. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> going to pause for a quick word from our sponsors and you know it our number one sponsor is wilson volleyball maker of the absolute best volleyballs in the game of beach volleyball and i know i know the avp season is over it was just a quick blip bam then it's gone but off season's here and that means that training season is here and you know you need some fresh wilson's to make the improvements you need over the off season or just to get together with a bunch of friends and play some volleyball And to play some volleyball with a bunch of friends, you need Wilson Volleyballs, all right? So use our discount code SANDCAST-20 to get 20% off all Wilson products, all right? That is SANDCAST-20 to get 20% off. So head over to wilsonvolleyball.com for your order today. And now, back to the show. So we have this movie, um, and so this, how long ago, so Tom Black wrote the script, Yeah. Um, and Tom, uh, for our listeners, he is currently the head coach at uh, University of Georgia Indoor, uh, formerly head coach at LMU. And so Tom Black is very good friends with uh, John Mayer. Uh, right. And, and Tom helped, I think he helped with the LMU Beach team. Uh, Mayer is now uh, head, head coach, coach of that, yeah. obviously. So how long ago did Tom write the script I, for I the movie? 20 years ago, at least 20 years ago. Uh, it was at the time when he was uh, living at the house. And he was going through the qualifier tour. Yeah. Uh, and he wrote the script. Also, you know, there were a lot of things that were happening in his life, quite personal things. And he kind of wrote this script as a catharsis of what he was struggling through. Right. And uh, I read it again, you know, three years ago. And at this stage, you know, we, we were great friends. Whenever we meet, we talk like we haven't met. But we, we right. talk every couple years at yeah. this stage, you know. And so I called him back and said, Tom, why don't we revive the script? Why don't we modernize it? Let's just change a couple of things that right. make sense for today's player yeah. and, and revive it. And he said, yeah, let, let's do it. And kind of we took it on faith uh, that we're just going to do it. And yeah. at, that, at the point where he wrote the script, there was no way I could have ever made it. Right. I was a beach bum. Yeah. So was he. Right. Uh, But things that happened along the way, and I'm running a movie studio, so I have the resources to make it, uh, and it just came to be the right time to do it. And uh, yeah, uh, what can I say? It's great to see something that you know would never have happened just kind of happen. Yeah, you know, 20 years later, you know, it's just so amazing. I love looking at just like the little. Just like not fate, but just like the patterns yeah. that, that that happened. So you know, when I was I'm 31 now. I mean, yeah. when I was 21, had never played beach volleyball, never watched yeah. beach volleyball. I'd never cared to watch beach volleyball because in Maryland, like it's a girls' sport. You play, right. you play basketball, you go to football games, the cross yeah. golf, whatever. And now, 10 years later, you know, when you you always get asked like, what's your five year plan, your 10 year plan? Yeah. And my 10 year plan had nothing to do with beach volleyball. Yeah, you know, and now here I am, like sitting across a movie studio with the CEO making a beach volleyball movie. I met you because I'm playing professional beach volleyball yeah. in Bulgaria, writing about it, whatever. And like Tom wrote this script 20 years ago, probably had no thoughts of it ever being yeah. made. 
and now here it is being made. Yeah. I love that stuff. It's incredible. Yeah. Well, actually, um, you know, I I never met you, but I read a lot of your work okay. before. And and I always felt like uh, you had much more to offer the world than just a beach volleyball player. Yeah. Just reading how you could write. And, and there are very few sports writers that can do this, but to... As I said, with movies, you can add emotion into the game. Yeah. And and your writing does that. It's it's a well balanced piece where you can understand what's it's clear, it's cogent. Yeah. But you also manage to insert the right amount of emotion without going overboard into it. Yeah. Which makes it readable. And sometimes, you know, especially today, you start with blog articles and you read maybe the title and maybe the first sentence and you're gone. Yeah. And I've always felt like I could read your writing and I could finish and that's rare, yeah. Because if you, if we notice the way we interact today with with life, Instagram, for instance, we're swiping, swiping, swiping so fast. Fast. We like, we like. We put a love thing. What, <laughs> what the hell? We really loved it. <laughs> you know, in two seconds we fell in love, and, and then two seconds later we love something else. Yeah. Really? You know, and, yeah. and uh, it's rare. And and I read a lot of scripts. I get about twenty, thirty. To be honest, I'll maybe read half, half of a script yeah. out of every thirty submissions. Which is probably longer but, than it. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, and I, I grew up reading, and I love reading, but I never have the time to read. And every time I read these days, I feel incredibly guilty because I should be reading right. something else. And so, clicking on your work and actually reading, I get the same experience because I'm there, and I don't want to do something else at the time. Right. So, so it's like uh, you're writing. Uh, you know, it's given me back the joy of reading. I appreciate that. So it's been really special. So I actually liked you before I even knew you. <laughs> yeah, I love <laughs> you it. Know? That's so awesome. It's, it's great to be working with you because I also didn't imagine that that would be the case. Yeah. You know, I just, oh, another article. And and I remember like, you know, I watch, read a lot about volleyball, but I remember like whenever I saw your name come up because of that experience, I'd, I'd click and read it. Yeah. So it was, I it was nice. It. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. It's been it's been a fun ride. I mean, it's just crazy just to see because like I just started writing about it because yeah. no one else was, and I loved it. Um, so it was just this like I just kind of made a, a crappy WordPress yeah. website, and then Volleyball Magazine yeah. picked it up, and then Dig Magazine was like, "Oh, we need a writer," and now the FIVB yeah. did well, the same thing. Uh, and, your article about Eric made me cry. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the most important things with like you. When I was a journalism major, uh, my big thing was features writing. I just yeah. took all the features classes that I could, and they're the biggest thing. They're like, you, you got to make people feel something, or they're not going to finish it because features are long stories. Right. And even when I was in journalism school, which I graduated in 2012, and this was like before Instagram, and people were like, people aren't going to read these. Like, you got to keep them tethered to the story somehow. Right. And the only way you can is emotion. Yeah. But then you have to find the balance, like you mentioned, of yeah. not. Being overly it, emotional, you yeah. can't be dramatic. Yeah. You're like, well, this is now we're getting crazy. Yeah. Um, so it's just a balance. I just read a ton. Yeah. Um, same as you. I mean, you read almost by assignment. Yeah. Just reading script yeah. after script after now script. No, it feels like a job. I used to read for fun. Now it's for work. Yeah. Yeah. And the worst is uh, <laughs> is stories about struggling script writers trying to make it. <laughs> oh, they say write what you know but please if you're a script writer do not write that story <laughs> I've read too many of them in my life yeah uh, it's, it's funny because my, my dad's notorious he's made more movies uh, than most mo he's made over 400 movies I don't think there's someone in the world that's made Jeez. that many movies and he's notorious for not reading scripts and they're like you know the most important thing in the movie is a story you got to tell a good story, and and he looks at the writers and he's like, "Okay, great, I agree with you. Yeah. Now tell a good story. Yeah. He turns it back, because at one point, you know, he gets more submissions than I do, and when I was working for him, I was doing coverages. At one point, I realized he didn't even read the coverages. What's a coverage? So it's a two-page summary of the script. Okay. And and actually, what he would read was just the log line. If the concept, <laughs> if he read the concept, he liked it, he'd hand it over to our head of creative at the yeah. time, it was Boaz Davidson, and he said, read the coverage. If Boaz Davidson liked the coverage, then he'd hand it on to one of his assistants, read the script, and then if they like the script, it goes back up. Yeah. And and a lot of script writers believe that the most important thing, and, and they're absolutely right, I'm not saying, the most important thing in the movie is the story. Of course it is. Right. But... 
Think of it from the audience perspective. Look at it the other way. You're going to go to a movie and 20% of the population that's been studied go to the movie for the advertising, the commercial. The rest of them go to the movie because that's what they do on Friday nights. Right. And they have a habit. Yeah. So they have a choice to make. At 8 o'clock or 8.30, they have two posters. And one has Brad Pitt in a Christopher Nolan film. Right. And the other one has his younger brother, Arm, in a first-time director's film. They're going to make a choice. They're going to trust that Brad Pitt and Christopher Nolan will deliver them an experience that they were willing to pay right. for. That's their opening weekend. Yeah. And next weekend, another movie is going to open. And this Armpit movie doesn't really... It stays in the theaters for six weeks. It's critically acclaimed. The critics love it. Right. Uh, the 20% saw the advert. They're saying, oh my God, this movie is the most amazing yeah. thing. I really felt for Arm. Yeah. You know, and everything. But that's not going to make the next movie and that's not going to make the money back. And it is a movie business. Right. So a lot of people denigrate that movie. Oh, it's too Hollywood. Yeah. It's too cliche. But that's what keeps the business going and yeah. that allows you to make the other movie. Yeah. So here we are making Expendables and we're also making Qualifying. Without Expendables, we wouldn't have the qualifying. resources to make Qualifying because we wouldn't have cameras, crews, equipments. Right. All these infrastructure things that have been built up here right. wouldn't exist without Hollywood. Yeah. You know, so it's very easy to sort of denigrate that kind of yeah. popcorn culture. But at the end of the day, if it's a Hollywood movie, it means that people actually liked it and went to see it. Right. So you've actually produced better art than the tracking shot of the lighthouse. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know which won the festival that, that year. Yeah. You know. And so what is the, the ultimate goal of qualifying? Um, as I said earlier, it's to take an audience member. First of all, I, I have to respect the players. The ultimate goal of qualifying is to make a movie that speaks to them and speaks to their experience. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, that's who we're making the movie for. But those players are going to tell their friends to watch the movie, and they're like, this one got it. Yeah. So the ultimate goal of qualifying is so to get it. It's got the journey. Of it's got the journey. Right? And it's not about the Olympic Games finals. It's about getting into the door. It's that one-star tournament that you have to get enough points to even enter in, right. and then you have to do well enough to get to the next one. Yeah. And that's the journey of Greg. He, he's just, uh, I mean... Maybe a little bit of a spoiler alert, but Greg loves to play. Yeah. He's always been the underdog, but he's always been the hard worker. Yeah. Kenny, who you play, yeah. is the talent. You know, he's, he's what Greg needs, and Kenny needs Greg, but Kenny's got an opportunity to go to uh, get a scholarship. So if he gives that up and goes to play beach volleyball, he's kind of letting down his family and he's letting down society because he's got a big opportunity. Yeah. But he also loves to play, and he shows up for Greg for Greg. So... The ultimate story about is a, is about a relationship, and of course we have Lisa who comes into the thing and, and sort of rocks Greg's world. Yeah, Lisa um, has her life made for her. She's going to NYU, but she takes a risk and decides to go on this wild and crazy journey with Greg. Yeah, and they meet, they fall in love, they fight, they fall back in love. Yeah, and uh, it, it's just a simple but a beautiful story. Yeah, that is kind of the backbone of the whole movie, but the movie is is by beach volleyball for beach volleyball. Yeah. So that's, that's the goal. <laughs> yeah. And I love it. Cause like it's as someone who is going through that journey, it's real, you know, Tom wrote it. Cause yeah. he was in it, you know, yeah. it's probably a little therapeutic for yeah. him to write it and it's real and you're producing it. So yeah. you know exactly what you're doing and, and you're in it and, and you, you're doing it. Yeah. And, and you have players in it who understand the journey and, yeah. and we can feel it and we can yeah. put those emotions because like we're not, we're acting, but we're not acting. Yeah. Like I'm literally playing basically myself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's such range. <laughs> yeah. Really stretching myself. Yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you're many different people as well. Like, you know, uh, the trick with acting I think is, is not acting. Yeah. In a theater, you're one person and you're acting to an audience and you have to connect for, from the front row to the back row in such a way where you have to overact. Yeah. A movie, the camera comes right in your face. Yeah. So as soon as you act, you know, the audience can say, oh, he's oh, yeah. acting. Immediately. So the goal for an actor in a movie is not to act as an actor in a theater is to act. Yeah. And often a lot of theater actors come into movies trained as actors yeah and they end up 
some of them playing good characters, but they never become movie stars. Yeah. And certain people who can not act become movie stars. Yeah. You know, uh, a classic example is Sylvester Stallone. He's always Stallone in all his movies. Yeah. He's got subtle nuances. <clears throat> There's a difference between Rocky and Rambo, of course. Yeah. That's the story around him, but, but it's always sly. Yeah. You know, it's always Statham. Yeah. In a movie. Yeah. <laughs> But you're you're looking at I know that's the difference between a movie star and an actor. Yeah, you know there's some great uh, actors like um, uh, Gary Oldman. He can play Churchill and he can play a Russian mobster villain, mm -hmm. and you buy that. So he, that's the character. Right. He's an actor. Yeah. He's got range and versatility. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, Meryl Streep. You know, she's an actress. You yeah. can always whatever role she's playing. You know, if she's a uh, uh, over over demanding boss, or she's the head of the Washington Post, she's the devil, or she's an angel. Right. You know, you buy it. Yeah. And uh, you know, so many so many people are in the middle there. Yeah. And then there's some great actors. We are great actors, but you're oh that guy I've seen him before. Right. You know. Yeah. He's been in so many movies. What's his name? <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But those are you say, like the first tier, second tier, and third tier. The first tier are the Meryl Streeps, yeah. which are so good in both, being characters and themselves. Right. Second tier are the Sylvester Stallones, which are just great. Yeah. As Sly, you just want to watch Sly kill a lot of people. Right. That's, that's, that's where you go. <laughs> yeah. And he's going to deliver oh, on yeah. that level. And, and he knows his audience so well. Like, I remember when we were doing uh, Rambo, Rambo 5. There was a scene uh, when he's driving across the border with, with the girl he rescued and she dies. Yeah. And the director is saying to him, Sly, I need you to cry here. And he tells the director, so he's like, Rambo doesn't cry. Rocky cries. <laughs> Rambo internalizes yeah. a lot of things. And he was so spot on because he built that character himself. Right. He knew exactly the nuance and he delivered such a performance that was such a sl subtle shift, but it was the difference between Rambo and Rocky. Mm -hmm. And that was like, he, he just knows what it is that he needs to deliver. Yeah. And so with this movie, uh, for our listeners, like, obviously it's impossible to put an exact date, but when can our listeners expect to watch qualifying on their screens at home? Well, uh, the big challenge at this point is uh, we're doing a movie with unknown actors. So the marketing department for the company I'm working with doesn't know how to sell it yet. Right. So it's one of those movies that you got to make and then sell, which is completely opposite to our traditional model where we sell and make. Right. So I'm not sure, but what this phase is, is super important. And we're going to sort of start to promote ourselves in a way. Yeah. And it's funny because I'm talking about all these other movies that I should be talking about. Qualifying. Watch qualifying. <laughs> uh, uh, but... We're going to be showing little snippets and stuff and, and kind of like uh, developing this movie organically. Yeah. Uh, currently, we're kind of like figuring it out as we go, the tone and feel of the movie. Yeah. But uh, we got a good crew on board and, and we're now capturing the, the heartbeat of the movie, which is the volleyball scene. So yeah. these next two weeks are going to kind of dictate how the rest of it goes. We have uh, the Lisa Gregg story. And we're going to go into the coach player story yeah. coming in next week. Yeah. But this is sort of the heartbeat of the movie. So uh, these next two weeks are going to dictate how well the movie goes. Right. Uh, as I said, the goal is to take you inside the game. So we're kind of playing with a lot of different camera techniques. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be using an HPV drone to simulate the, the ball flying across the net. Yeah. And how do we shoot that and then cut into a, a pass? Yeah. Uh, yesterday we had a, a, by the way, I got to say a lot of credit to Jake and Will, our Canadian players that came out. Jake, I mean, he's he's a Canadian, super polite, super reserve, reserved. We told him to like uh, take the lid off here yeah. and say what he thinks. And what goes on in that guy's head is hilarious. So, so funny. I he, was watching his scenes yeah. from out my window and just here and I'm just like, cause Jake, so Jake McNeil, Canadian guy, he plays this uh, trash talking hotshot. Yeah. He's the, he's the number one seed. He's the big dog. Uh, imagine like a, uh, sort of like a Dana. Yeah. And, uh, and Jake just was just going, talking so much shit. Yeah. <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah. 
Yeah, Dana Camacho, I mean, uh, what a great player. I, I remember when he was 18 and, and athletic. And Dana, you're still athletic if you're out there listening. <laughs> I don't think Dana listens <laughs> yeah, to this. <laughs> Dana doesn't listen. Yeah. Uh, he was the, the sort of mastermind behind the Sky Bowl before Adrian, actually. Uh, and he was playing down in Florida. But he was such, such fun to watch and such a character. And, uh, you know, I, I see the sort of like, we all think the things he says. <laughs> yeah. But the way Jake says them, it's just hilarious. And, and uh, his timing is impeccable. You know, he's got such comedic timing. So it's been super fun to, like, watch him just let, let loose out there. Yeah. And that's something we're going to be capturing more and more of because he's like, you discover things. Like, uh, you're very likable and you're good on camera and, and you want to know what you're doing. Uh, Trevor, you know... He's an actor, but he was a volleyball player. So the other unique thing about this movie is we're actually using volleyball players. So we don't have to cut away from things that we can't right. show. You know, inside out, the example is a 360 set. No volleyball player would ever. <laughs> right. You know, they wouldn't eat with their hands afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? And uh, yeah. so, so Jake, who's our, our, our villain in this movie, so to speak, they're the number one seed. They're supported by Adidas. They're the sponsored. They have the easy ride where Kenny and Greg have to figure out where, the, you know, to get a piece of toast in the restaurant right. and how they're going to eat for lunch. The road is paved for these guys. And our coach, John, is commissioned by Adidas to coach these guys because that's where the money is. Yeah. That's where the corporations are. But he sees something in Greg that, that he doesn't see in his team. So he ends up coaching Greg in a way. And there's a transition where he's got to call his wife up and tell, tell him, hey, I'm not going to be coaching the A team. I'm going to take a risk yeah. on this B team. She's like, well, what about the money? You're supposed to get paid. And I was like, don't, don't want the money. Right. I want to see this kid succeed. Yeah. Because he just kind of sees something. He was an ex-player and he sees something that he can relate to. Mm -hmm. So there, there's that sort of storyline going. And, uh, you know... Uh, Jake, back to where we started this yeah. conversation, uh, another great discovery because here's this player, he's super athletic, he's competing on the tour, he's going to, you know, go up to a certain level, uh, you know, we're only one winner and, you know, right. Jake's not Phil, but he's got such a passion for the game. Yeah. And then inside his head is this other narrative going Yeah. that, that sort of you can see, uh, I like to call it the demons and I, 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 I uh, a good friend of mine, Kenyon Seaman. Yeah. We had this long talk about it is, you know, Kenyon Seaman, 6'3", had a cannon arm, uh, competed, but how did he get as good as he got? And yeah. we, we talked about it. And there's, inside of us, there's the demons, the you're not good enough. You're not going to get right. it. And then there's the angels that like, you can do this. You will do it. And those demons are just as important as the angels to make, oh, make yeah. you work. For sure. Because those demons are going <clears> to... <throat> pull you out of bed in the morning to go train or mm -hmm. give you that one extra rep in the gym when your, your body is crying and you don't want to do anything. Those are the demons that are going to pay, pave your way to success later. Yeah. So inside Jake sits this demon, which drives him. And he says things to, in his head to other players that motivate him and say, Hey, I'm better than you. I'm going to beat you. And when they don't, do things successfully. He celebrates in sight. Yeah. And he's like, what a hack. <laughs> Perfect set. No block up. He's right, right at me. You're yeah. easy. How do you spell easy? G-R-E-G. -E <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know? He's always, you know, putting down... Greg. And they played together in college, which is a, a thing, you know. Uh, Greg was the, the bench warmer. Uh, Dave was our all-star, you know, and he's always been putting Greg down through his whole, whole career. And now comes the stage where Greg and Kenny are playing together against him on the beach. And uh, Dave, Dave and Scott's like, why are we practicing in these hacks? Well, they're the other American team and there's no risk for them to pick up your tendencies. Yeah. It's good. John, the coach, says these are the perfect people to practice against. And so, uh, you know, back to Jake, I'm sorry, I'm going all over the place, but but what he says in his head is so freaking funny. It is. And, and when he says it and how he says it, it's the delivery. Like, 
no actor will ever get that. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, you can rehearse 17 <laughs> takes, but what comes naturally from Jake is, is amazing. So, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited for our audience to experience that. Yeah, I am too. And Jake, I mean, when we were on the road, because like me, Will and Jake, we've become like such close friends just from this journey because like we were in Bulgaria together for like five weeks and then we went to me and Adam were like debating pulling out of Italy and the Netherlands because yeah. like we were just in a terrible slump yeah. just like this epic losing streak and I was like Jake and Will are going yeah <laughs> <You know? laughs> it'll be great and like we did a day in Amsterdam and, and just like and Jake was looking forward to shooting this movie so much. And yeah. he was just like, you sucked in college and you sucked now. And he's just like embracing <laughs> yeah. it to the fullest. Yeah. Loves it. It's yeah. so funny. And yeah, then like we're all just fired up on it. Yeah. Look, uh, I, you know, I just got to give you a, a little bit of feedback. And just from my own experience, you know, you, you go with a partner and you do get those slumps. Yeah. And you start looking around. And, and this is not just for you, but for all the players. It's like those slumps are the most important part of your development than the good times. Yeah. There's only one winner in the tournament. Right. But can you figure out how to win when things aren't going well? And if you can figure out how to win when things aren't going well, when things are going well, you'll be crushing teams. Yeah. But instead of like, for all your players that, you know, don't succeed with a tournament, instead of like pointing the finger outwards, there's always three pointing back at you whenever right. you do that. Look at what you can do to help your partner better. Yeah. Look, my partner is getting served every ball. He can't side out. Yeah. Well, maybe it's my setting. Right. <laughs> that, that needs work. Yeah. You know? And instead of saying, you know, because I see it so, so many times and it's almost like uh, self-sabotaging. Like, you, you go play with a partner, you train all off-season. Tournament one, you don't do as well as you think you guys do. You guys are out <laughs> and you're hunting for a partner the whole season. Yeah. And then you're like, mid-season you're scrambling and you're calling everyone on the roster and you end up playing with someone worse because you just want to play that tournament right if you're going to train with someone for a whole off season and you're not doing well that's okay because there's always next season to do better right but let's find ways within this season to improve is it our communication is it our you know attitude is it our dynamic as a team because eventually you'll figure it out and you'll win games just on the one or two points that you know where the other guy's gonna be because you, you've done that move so many times. Yeah. I've taken a line, I've left the seam open so many times and my partner's been so frustrated as, hey, stop leaving that seam open, yeah. that one day he's just gonna step in on the seam and yeah. dig that ball. And mm -hmm. that's that one point that makes 21-19. Yep. So whenever you're out there on a slump and, and you're, it's so easy to blame. Yeah. Because why would we blame ourselves? Right. That would. That would be like, we're perfect. Oh, we're perfect, yeah. <laughs> we're not perfect, but we're way better than that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, find, find ways within the game to support each other. And that's, that's what the other beautiful thing about beach volleyball is, is you're there with one other guy. Yeah. And there's no one to blame. Really, there isn't. Yeah. Even the other guy, he's not the one to blame. Right. Like, okay, I've been setting 50 balls this tournament. Or I've been hitting... Sets all over the place this whole tournament. Right. What could I do better? Yeah. You know, do I do I really got to get angry at one bad set because two weeks ago there was another bad set? Right. You know, what's what's that emotion that's coming? And those the slumps are the best part of your game. Yeah. Those are the things that are going to teach you so much more than the good times. Problems aren't problems. Yeah. They're opportunities, the opportunities for, for growth. growth. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so that's just kind of my thing to you and and to all the players out there listening. You know, because I've, I've been through that, you know, where I'm blaming or I'm being the one blamed, yeah. you know. And and it's funny, I remember uh, sitting on the beach, uh, I think it was with Tom actually, uh, maybe Tom or Eric might were playing a tournament, and two of the players that were good uh, AAA players at the time, Carl Owens and Sammy Agigi, they played all the tournaments together. And uh, they had the same pattern. They would do really well against the easy matches and the tough, the yeah. Tough matches, they would get smoked, and the medium matches, they would lose because they would fight against each other. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I remember sitting there on the beach, and, and Carl walks out, and he goes, "Evan partner, he sucked. He didn't do anything. <laughs> and he walks away, and then Sam walks out, and he says the same, "Evan partner, he sucked. He couldn't do anything. <laughs> and, and it was like this realization, like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're, it's easy to blame. 
Always. And, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That, that's to the slumps. <laughs> Opportunities for growth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I know that you have a, a crazy busy day. Yeah. A lot of wrangling to do. Time, yeah. So uh, I don't want to keep you any longer. Um, it has been a pleasure, and I'm, uh, I'm stoked for these next couple of weeks. It'll yeah, be fun getting to hang stoked, out yeah. all the time and shooting this movie, and um, whatever help I can do, I can be to on the promotional side. Yeah. I'm here for you. Just be yourself. <laughs> Just be myself. Yeah, that's all we're asking. Yeah, buddy. Everyone right. else is taken. <laughs> that's true. I love that quote. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, well, I'll let you get to your day, Eureka. Cool. It was a pleasure. Always love Good chatting stuff. with you. Yeah. Shoots. Shoots.